All right, here we go. Welcome to Out of Home Insider. Today's episode is brought to you by LED Truck Media. LED Truck Media specializes in hyper-local, street-level campaigns that get your message in front of the right people. Whether your campaign is one day or one month, with nationwide coverage, your campaign can be live in any major market within 24 hours. If you want to reach your perfect audience in a truly engaging way, visit LEDTruckMedia.com. LED Truck Media, out-of-home advertising 2.0. Thanks again for making today's show possible. All right, without further ado, let's meet today's guest. Today's guest is Ian Dallimore. Ian is the Vice President of Digital Growth and GM of Programmatic at Lamar Advertising. Getting his start with Lamar in events and sports marketing, Ian embraced digital out of home over a decade ago and has been at the tip of the spear for innovation and strategy ever since. Ian is the Chairman of the Innovation Committee at the OAAA and can be found frequently speaking at conferences, on webinars, and contributing to industry publications about what's new and what is coming. In a recent press release for Accretive Media, Ian is quoted saying that the industry is yearning for new, impactful ways to amplify the success of their out-of-home investments, something we're going to talk about here today. Ian, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks so much. And look, I've enjoyed the podcast myself. I think uh, we've all kind of yearned for more data and information. And look, I'm petrified of flying. So this whole COVID thing and not having to be on an airplane once a week like I used to be, this is great. So yeah, again for right. Having me. No, absolutely. And I was reflecting last night, I was going to the grocery store and I thought, how cool is out of home, right? I've got my circle graphics mug, but yesterday was my water bottle. I've got the vote as if hoodie from our friend, Rick Robinson at Billups and uh, yeah. you know, rocking some, uh, some of my own swag, uh, which is a pretty cool place to be. In. And it's, a, it, it's certainly an interesting time. I'm going to send you some uh, Lamar swag. We got some. Lamar oh, yeah. Stocks. Yeah. See, folks, if you're thinking about reasons why to start a podcast, getting swag is probably the number one reason. So definitely something to consider. But Ian, you've, you've been doing a little bit of the, uh, the Dallamore tour recently and talking about all things programmatic and, and what's coming down the pipe. What's new and exciting in your world right now? Yeah, and, you know, I'm very passionate about the company that I work for. You know, Lamar Advertising, been around for over 117 years. And one of the things that I love about our company is, you know, we have a slogan, it's um, innovating since 1902. And, you know, the, the executives here in our board, they're constantly, you know, pushing us, specifically myself and a handful of others, to think what's new and what's happening. I think, uh, you know, one of the biggest things, obviously programmatic has become massive in our space. Um, you have some naysayers, which is fine. Uh, we'll have some people that'll have some catching up to do, but I think generally the biggest thing that's happening in our space right now, and, you know, you can thank COVID has accelerated a lot of businesses is the use of automation. So whether that's programmatic with our supply side partners like Vistar, Place Exchange, Broadsign, Hivestack, Magnite, or what I'm really excited about is our agency out of home specialist partners. You know, they're really pushing towards, you know, hey, we have a platform and, you know, we don't want to live in this spreadsheet world where we're having conversations back and forth. You know, can we just connect our inventory? And, you know, that's a big focus for Lamar is how do we make APIs available to everyone? And, you know, if yourself, you want to start an agency tomorrow or a platform, then you'll have access to, you know, at the beginning, over 5,000 large format digital and in the very near future, access to all, you know, 400,000 plus of our static inventory. And I, I think that that's the most exciting thing that's happening in our space is there's this evolution of how we transact. And I think COVID has helped accelerate that. And a lot of companies like Lamar, you know, I know a good friend of mine, Andy Strebus, um, that's their focus at out front as well is how do we expose inventory? So it's, that's, that's the exciting thing. One of the exciting things. No, it's certainly something that's exciting. Break it down for somebody that's maybe heard programmatic as a, as a buzzword that, that, you know, it's bounced around the office, you know, especially for our, our local sellers, our local business development reps, break down what programmatic really means. Yeah. And, and look, it's, in my opinion, it's not there yet for the local advertiser. And we could talk about that a bit later, but basically it's, it's the ability to use systems and data to be deterministic on how to buy inventory. So quick example, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a brand and I buy inventory online and social and mobile, 
I simply go onto a, what's called a DSP or a demand side platform. I put my parameters, maybe it's audience, maybe it's a specific uh, overlay of um, data that says, hey, I want to target a consumer that frequences quick service restaurants. And here's the here's my total impressions or maybe my budget. In the online space, it's simple as that. Click a button and then it's real-time bidding or RTB. And it's bidding on inventory on the online and mobile space. About seven years ago, Lamar jumped in that space and the industry has since followed. And now when a brand uh, goes to their DSP and they simply put in those parameters, now they have the ability where they overlay that same data and it's broken out and they're bidding on real time, large format digital out of home, or maybe they're bidding on, um, you know, elevator network or a health club network or, you know, other place based screens. And now we've become a part of that media mix of real time buying. And it's really, it's imperative if we talk about it at the local level, it's imperative that we understand that it's not just digital out of home, but it's the mobile device, it's, you know, your desktop. So that omni-channel approach is is key when you're buying that way. And that's kind of why I said we're not there yet at the local level because we don't want just one media mix being purchased. Um, so that that's kind of it. Hopefully I dissected yeah. it all in now, a No, I think that that's a great explanation. And I, I agree. I think that the timeline has been shifted completely and we're going to really see accelerated growth. Where do you think the growth for programmatic is going to come from? You know, the biggest thing that we always talk about when when I first presented this to our board um, was, look, there's a hundred and thirty eight billion dollar industry that exists that serves up these you know, respectfully shitty banner ads. <laughs> <laughs> like nobody gets excited about it. Like I've sure. never. Yeah, I've never seen like an award ceremony for like, hey, greatest banner. Ad. <laughs> um, so I, I really, you know, when we first dove into this and really kind of 100 percent myself is focused on this is, you know, we're talking about amazing screens that can change based off of audience types, based off of weather conditions, based off of political clients or comments by, you know, after that amazing debate the other night. (laughs) Riveting. Yeah. Clients have the ability now to incorporate that. And, you know, that DSP and digital agencies are now excited that they can now transact and purchase. And uh, that that is what is the driving force behind this, is how do we capture net new dollars in the out-of-home space, introduce them to our medium. And look, our medium as an industry is amazing. And you know, you've done you know, tons of podcasts about it with great people. You know, more and more every day we're seeing digital buyers that are like, man, this this medium is so great. Like yeah. I can target ski towns. Oh, I can target specific where they're used to this, just like, you know, billions of ads on the internet that they have no clue where they are. So, so it, it, it's, it's exciting. That's awesome. It's easy effectiveness. Talk to me about measurement, right? Once the excitement wears off and sure it's easy to do, but how do we prove out of home is working for yeah. brands that invest in it? And I, and I think, and that's a, perfect question because I think before we could get to exposing our inventory programmatically, we had to figure out some way. And when I say we, I mean, collectively, the industry, collectively, the data partners that have now flooded our space, we had to be able to determine a few things. Like after you were exposed to an ad, where did you go? Or what was your thought about that brand? And there's, and there's multiple different ways to think about this, right? There's the simplest form, which is device IDs. So anonymous device IDs on your mobile device is driving past a billboard, whether it's static, whether it's a bus bench or a digital screen, you're able to say, okay, anonymous device, one, two, three, four, five, drove past this panel. Where did that device go over the next 15 days? And did it end up at my big box retailer or right. my you know, automotive dealership? And now we're able to do that with confidence and to be able to give those advertisers the ability to say, you know, verified walk-in. Or there's other ways to do it where we can say, exposed to the digital out of home or static or whatever the case may be. And now I can do a uh, mobile retargeting where I can hit that person if they're at a competitor store 
or they're at a soccer field because I'm targeting moms with two plus kids and I can retarget them. So there's, there's multiple different ways. And what we're talking about is attribution, right? And every programmatic campaign that runs today has measurement layered on. Otherwise, right. most of the time they're not running. But now we can now extend this over to just traditional direct buys as well. And, and I think that that's key to the success of our industry because every other media type that you buy in the online, mobile, and social, you get this cool little tracker on the side. You can see how it's performing. We can now become apples to apples. And it's when we're talking about it, it's data that they're used to talking about in the online world is now in the um, out of home world. Yeah. I, like I played with blip a little bit a few months ago and it, as a digital marketer, I loved the little dashboard and seeing what I was getting. I knew it was just vanity stuff, right? It was impressions and you know a little chart, but it, it, it satisfied me that I was getting the thing I was paying for. Yeah. And I'm sure that that's got to go a long way. You used a perfect, uh, a perfect phrase that the out of home is becoming flooded with different data measurement companies and, and people vying to be the standard, et cetera. How do you see this all shaken out, right? It's kind of a fragmented space already. What what needs to happen? Do we just adopt a, a certain unit of measure? Is Geopath that? Like, what 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 do you? How do you see this all shaken out? Yeah, and you know, uh, I sit on the innovations committee for the AAA, and we have a few subcommittees, and we talk about this, right? You know, we you as an industry, you can't pick one specific company, but we can have some kind of guidelines and parameters around, like, you know, how to vet companies. Um, what, what, what is the methodology? So that is something that the OAAA does provide is kind of like, here are the players in the space and these are the questions you should be asking. And this is the methodology behind that. I think that that's imperative. The beauty of what's happening is kind of the free market. And I love that we now have, and myself, I talk to brands direct and digital agencies. And for example, we, had a, we have a campaign that's running right now that is overlaid with uh, voter data. L2 is the company and the data. And when we were having the conversation, we were able to say, hey, we're able to overlay L2, which you know you want to target independence. And immediately, Tim, it's like, oh, L2, yeah, we use them for our online. Oh, so there's that awful. level of, yeah. So there's that level of like comfort. And more importantly is measurement is across all media and the data itself. So they feel confident about it. So I think that that's a big key to it is introduce the players that are in the space in the on, online world. And, you, you know, you hear the guys live ramp, they own that universe. You know, they have hundreds of different data segmentations. Um, but again, we can't forget about our friends at Geopath that act as the base layer of what an impression is. Um, so you, it's a long-winded way of saying what the industry should do is continue to kind of set parameters and guidelines to help make sure, you know, intersections not measuring different than the way, you know, out front's measuring or as an independent is, is measuring completely different. We need the consistency. Um, and, and we ran into this with um, mobile and out of home years ago when we first introduced that to the space. It was more guidelines and let the free market run and see who's interested in the space. And more importantly, when that happens is, is we get to evolve as an industry in that space. And we all kind of learn together. What do you think is the likelihood, if any, that somebody moves laterally into the space? Uh, someone, Roku, moves into the out-of-home space. Do you think that there's a possibility of some crazy shakeup like that? Yeah, I, look, I think it's cool. I working with Craig, who I know has been on your podcast at, yep. at Credit Media. You know, him and I had the conversation almost a year ago now, and we were like, "Dude, how great would it be if we can connect CTV and OTT to an out of home campaign the way we did 11 years ago with mobile and out of home?" Mm. So I think you know, again, just simply putting that thought in people's minds and, and people being tech companies like. Hey, did you ever know the out of home space could do this? And you know, your media is different, right? And how do you, how do, you, how would you think that we could play in this space? And that's, look, that's why Google's intrigued about our space. That's why Facebook's intrigued about our space. You know, Roku, 
um, Hulu. There's a ton of companies that are not only intrigued in our space from a, an advertiser standpoint, you know, some of these tech companies are the largest spenders in our space, but more importantly, the back end of their companies, the data side, the measurement, the transacting side, they're becoming very interested in the out of home space because, you know, again, my smart ass comment about, you know, a tiny banner app. <laughs> Um, it look, it's we've been around forever, and we've, unlike a lot of other media's, we've evolved with the times, and I think that that's key for for us to continue for another 117 years at Lamar. Absolutely, no, that, that's uh, it, it. Would be it would certainly move the ball forward at a uh, at a faster rate. So, what do you think needs to happen? for that to take place or is it just a matter of uh, of time and we're just we're just kind of waiting it out here no i think you obviously time plays into it but i think that they're the the biggest thing that we have to do as an industry you know and i sit on way too many committees but we talk about this all the time and and i always bring up i'm like but the most important thing is education you have to continue to educate people on the why and why this is important. Like I always use the phrase, like don't use technology for technology's sake. Um, you know, years ago, people would be like, oh yeah, QR codes, is, they're so amazing, <laughs> RFID tags. And you'd be driving down the interstate and you would see a QR code on like a billboard and you're like, what? <laughs> so Coronavirus you know, saved the QR code. They did, yeah. But I, look, to answer your question, I think we have to do a great job of educating the people that come from outside of our space, regardless who they are, if they're data companies, tech platforms, or, you know, future things like wearables and driverless cars, we have to educate them enough about our medium so that they become enticed enough to think different. And and I look, I, one of my favorite people is Elon Musk and he, he had no business nor he cared about a driverless car, but he threw the idea out there. And all of a sudden these, tech companies came about, automotive companies started thinking different. And I think we need to do more of that. Uh, I say that all the time, like throw out crazy ideas, like the CTV thing, that may be the craziest idea, but there may be someone at a CTV or or maybe a DSP that transacts, that buys uh, OTT and CTV. And they may say, yeah, that's actually brilliant. Let's run with it. Or they may say, that's the stupidest idea ever. And we try the next thing. And I think that that's key in this space, like continue to evolve. Um, and, and, you know, I, w- I was given the nickname when I was a kid by my mom, the future when I was super young, because I'd always like throw out these bizarre ideas. So I continue to throw out the idea that out of home can be a pivotal part of the advancements of wearables and driverless car. Like I may bank my career on that. Hey, well, listen, it's it's here. It's on the record. We'll make sure to uh, check back on it every so often and see yeah, see how sure. you're making out against it. Talk to me about that. Then you started out at Lamar as a as a as a young man, and uh, and you've grown into this role. How did that all come to be? And what pointers could you give somebody who's maybe just getting into out of home or is looking to grow within an organization? Yeah, and, and look, I love. Uh, I have a few mentors uh, throughout my career. I started, before I came to Lamar, I, I worked in minor league baseball. I was way too young as the director of marketing of a AAA baseball team, um, followed a girl and ended up here as an intern. And one of the biggest things that I'll say is, you know, I, I always had this mentality. Like if I have an open door policy, um, I've been at Lamar for 15 years and ever since I started my career prior to Lamar, I would always just, you know, I found the GM and the owner of the baseball team. And I would say, Hey, can I just schedule 10 minutes with you a week? And I'm just going to ask you a few questions. And again, no agenda, just purely like for me to learn. Um, So that, that would be my first thing. And I I encourage a lot of people that I interact with. um, I speak at a lot of universities or did travel to a lot of universities and talk about that like people get excited about talking about the things that they do. Um, And so that would be the first thing I'd recommend. Find a few mentors, you know, mine here at Lamar, Tommy Teeple, who's our CMO, the guy's a God in our space. Uh, John Miller, who's our SVP of sales. He was my boss for quite some time. And they both believed in me a lot. 
enough to let me kind of run. And then our CEO, Sean Riley, you know, has always helped foster creative growth. And he does that for a lot of his employees here. Like, yeah, go run that way and figure it out. So that would be my second thing. Like, never think an idea is crazy. Um, you know, the, the amount of knowledge that exists in our space, the amount of people that exist in the space that want to share. And, and quite frankly, you know, I'm 41 years old and 15 years, I would love to see a ton of people that sit on our innovations committee that are much younger than me take over and maybe they run in a completely different direction. Um, and the last thing that I would say is expand your mind. Um, you know, I start every day by listening to some podcast that has nothing to do with the out of home space. Um, and then I also um, master class is another thing that I schedule. I wake up at 430 every morning, go to the gym and have about 45 minutes of just like random time, whether it's read scriptures and or watch like master class, Gordon Ramsay, um, picked up skateboarding by Tony Hawk at the age of 41. Like expand your mind to where you're not just thinking about out of home all day and yeah. the future of out of home. You're starting to think about things like, oh, wow, obsession with Elon Musk. He did this. Let me take that and put it into this. Um, so that would be the last thing that I recommend. Um, and, and just don't be bashful. Like this is such a cool space that's so old yet so young in our new phase um, as an industry. Yeah, it's, <laughs> no, that's like, it's all awesome. And I totally agree. Like, so I stole this from Gino Sesto at, uh, at Dash 2. He yep. said that he listens to podcasts when he sleeps and that he gets great ideas. And I was thinking about brainwaves and I'm into all that sort of stuff. I was like, you know what? I'm going to try to do that. So I started to listening, listening to uh, Lex Friedman's <laughs> podcast about AI. And like, that's not a Wait. thing that I know about. Um, so every day it's like just this great little programming mechanism and it's triggering new ideas and different things. And, and, uh, yeah, I strongly encourage that as well. Do you well, have, I, a left off, I left off the most important one. Um, yeah. so I have, I have eight year old triplets and then a little six year old dude, listen to your kids. Heck yeah. I'm telling you, I know you have kids like, dude, I started skateboarding because I was jealous that my son Jake was such a badass skateboarder. <laughs> and now we like skateboard and we talk about things that, I think is the coolest thing. Like now we, before they go to bed uh, once a week, we'll look up into the stars and use this stargazing app. And they're like telling me about things I had no idea about. So listen to your kids. That's, and if you don't have kids, like find a kid in the neighborhood, make sure their parents are around. <laughs> yeah. Just crap with them, ask them some things. They full of knowledge, way smarter than we'll ever be. So true. It was funny when, when this was all going on. So I used the garage as kind of like a, a mini batting cage. We have mini whiffle, <laughs> mini whiffle balls and he'll just get reps, just reps of swings. And, uh, right. He knew that I'd been furloughed and he's like, daddy, you could start a business. I was like, Oh yeah. What's that? He's like, parents could drop their kids off at the garage and then they can wait in their car and you could do baseball lessons with them in the garage. And he was, he's seven. I'm like, the, the fact that you're even considering, like, how do we solve problems and do it in a way that could potentially generate money is yeah. very cool. Um, so the other day he told me that octopus eat with their tentacles. I'm like, I, yep. I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. My kids teach me stuff every single day. I strongly encourage that. For so sure. other than listening to the kids, is there a specific podcast that, uh, that, that you personally love? Does anything stand out? Yeah. Um, so I subscribed to Masterclass. Okay. What's that about? James Heller was talking about that the other yeah, day. Yeah. So Masterclass, it's a conglomerate of like all these different people, different industries. Like I learned uh, about Bob Iger and about his his career, how he started from the bottom, and then he created the obviously Disney Empire. Um, it's a paid subscription. It's it's about 180 bucks, but it's just random people, and you take these like 15 minute video segmentations. And then at the end of it, they kind of give you like a, a PDF that you can read through and kind of reference often. Um, listen to like an FBI hostage negotiator. Yeah, uh, I mentioned learning how to skateboard with Tony Hawk. Um, so uh, again, that's a big one for me, Masterclass. Um, I just started listening to the Joe Rogan podcast. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you picked I'm, a heck of a time. I'm, 
on the record, I've never done smoked a cigarette, done drugs in my entire life. But listening to him talk <laughs> to Mike Tyson, <laughs> I had to take a few showers, but that was great. Um, and then, you know, I'm a, I'm a Catholic. Um, so there's some, some scripture podcasts. Uh, we have a preach, uh, a priest here in Baton Rouge. He's pretty young and he's called the rapping priest. And this dude is just so cool. He's like 31 years old. And he talks about his perspective in life and how he's, you know, went through Catholicism, but, you know, I'll listen to that to get some wisdom in scripture. Um, and then, you know, really just kind of random. Like I, I, I love going on and listening to leadership and, and um, learned about Mozart the other day and kind of like started went down this weird path of, but yeah, it's, look, I think I want to start a podcast. So I'm going to hit you up. And <laughs> totally. Yeah. Cause everyone tells me like, Ian, you have the most interesting friends, but it's just cause we work in a really cool industry. So I think I'm going to start a podcast and it's going to be called like my interesting friends. You heard it here first. Make sure to subscribe to it as soon as it drops. We'll, 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 yeah, I, listen, that's been the coolest experience for me. And you were talking about earlier with, with mentors. I started the podcast n- not thinking that anyone would ever listen, but I figured if I could talk to really smart people, it would help accelerate my learning curve. Uh, it has certainly done that. And, and the fact that it can add some value to some other folks' lives, that's pretty cool too. So I, I fully support you and encourage you doing that. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Ian, where can folks find you? Where are you most active? Where should people check you out? Yeah, um, professionally active on LinkedIn, um, active on Twitter. Love to share the campaigns that we're doing, what the industry is doing great. Um, and then if you're, I'm a bit of a sneakerhead, um, have over 110 pairs. My Damn. wife's going to me. Uh, so if you want to follow me on Instagram, you could see all my uh, shoe collection, my crazy life with the hashtag Dalamore 4 and kind of the adventures that we have. So I, look, and any of your listeners can email me directly. Love to love to share knowledge. I think that's the only way we grow in this space. Excellent. Absolutely agree. We'll make sure to link out to all that in the description, the show notes, so you can connect with Ian. Ian, any parting thoughts for the, uh, for the audience at home? Yeah, and maybe it's because I have four kids or that I've been to Disney World 17 plus times, but one of my favorite movies uh, is Alice in Wonderland, the most updated one. And I love sharing this quote because it kind of thinks about innovation, thinks about the future. Uh, but it goes, the only way to achieve the impossible is to believe that it's possible. So that's kind of my parting words for everybody. Like never think something is and should stay the way that it is. Think and continue to think. I think that's a perfect way to end the show. If you found value in this, please share it with somebody else who could benefit. Make sure to uh, smash the subscribe button down below. That helps us a ton. Leave a like, like, leave a comment, and we'll see you guys next time. 